Welcome back to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food, exploring the greatest challenges facing the food system and the innovations and entrepreneurs looking to solve them. I'm your host, Matt Eastland, and on today's show, we're embarking on a culinary journey into the future, setting our sights on the biggest trends we think will shape the global food systems landscape in 2024 and beyond. As we step into the new year, there are three key drivers of momentum and change in the agriculture and food industries that I think are worth mentioning. Firstly, 2023 was the year that really put the importance and power of food on the map. So we've had a super successful COP28, which has highlighted how focusing on food and agriculture is critical in tackling climate change, finally. Secondly, consumer interest in health and data nutrition is skyrocketing. And lastly, a growing appreciation for farmers and regenerative agriculture is sweeping the globe as we take pride in understanding the origins of our food. In this episode, we explore countless opportunities for activists, entrepreneurs and innovators to make their mark on the food system on the back of this swelling interest. And joining us today are two extraordinary individuals leading the charge in this dynamic space. First up, we have Ben Ebrol in the studio, a professionally trained chef, author and co-founder of the immensely popular YouTube channel Sorted Food. And beyond their mouth-watering cooking videos, Sorted Food is a vibrant community boasting almost 3 million subscribers. Ben and his old school friends make cooking approachable, friendly, and most importantly, fun for everyone. And with his finger on the pulse of the food world, we're eager to hear Ben's thoughts on the upcoming year. Ben, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Great to have you. And we're also honoured to have Matthew Kessler on the line from Uppsala in Sweden. Hopefully I've got that right. Presenter of the Feed podcast and researcher for the groundbreaking discussion platform, The Table. So The Table hosts global food system debates, fostering a candid dialogue on the future of food, while the Feed podcast engages with innovators transforming the food system. Matthew brings a profound understanding of the food system today and ideas about where it's heading in the future. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Great stuff, guys. Brilliant to have you both on the show. Okay, for everybody listening, get ready for an insightful and inspiring conversation as we uncover the opportunities that lie ahead in revolutionizing our food systems. Let the food fight begin. As mentioned in the introduction, there's lots that's been going on in the food system for 2023 and going into 2024. So before we get into that, any top highlights that you've both got from both your perspectives on what's happened in 2023 that you'd like to join, uh, you'd like to our listeners to know about? Ben, anything from you? I think it is the focus on food waste and the importance of that. And I think so often we hear about problems at the farm gate, which is a big thing that obviously needs solving as well. But actually from normal home cooks in households, there is so much food that goes to eat. And it might only be half a cabbage here or, you know, a couple of dollops of sour cream there. But it all adds up because everybody's little amount of ingredients scales massively and we're throwing away a third of our food. And I think that's the biggest shift that people are beginning to realise that food equals money. Right. So it's hitting them where it actually hurts, which right now in cost of living crisis is like, actually... I could save pennies and pounds by just planning a bit better. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll talk about some of these sort of challenges driving the trends. Matthew, on your side, are you seeing the same thing from the industry? Is food waste starting to kind of hot up as a topic? I mean, we're certainly seeing this a lot on the podcast. Obviously, we've seen a lot going on in like the regulatory space as well. Like, what's it, EU? Finally, we've got like a first food waste regulation, so people have to measure it. But is that what you're seeing from yourself? Yeah, if you can get past all the AI headlines and news of this year, there was quite yeah. a lot on food. I really purchased from the kind of global food systems. Like I will jump into, you know, very specifics and regional uh, data, but there was an FAO report that came out earlier this year that estimated we're wasting about $10 trillion a year uh, mm -hmm. on food. So there's a massive hidden cost on our health and our environment and society that comes from the food system. So the calls for transformation are growing. The calls to integrate food and climate in the same conversation, it seems like that's finally happening. But I still wonder if we're, you know, using the same kind of top line messages and not really changing our tune so much, right? Mm -hmm. So we're hearing the vegans, the vegetarians, part of the environmental movement calling for reductions in livestock numbers, especially in the global north. And we're hearing the industry players calling for more efficient and climate smart solutions. We've got Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
the big open grasslands for livestock, they're not actually looking at reducing total numbers of livestock, but they're looking at how do we kind of tweak this and make it more efficient, you know, introduce these methane inhibitors, you know, methane's a short-lived, powerful greenhouse gas emission that's released in the atmosphere. So how do we make parts of our system more efficient? And I think that's an interesting kind of tension that I'm really curious to see kind of how it evolves in the future. Okay. So you think that there's been a lot of good talk on both sides, but maybe not quite as much action. Although, interestingly, Ben, you're saying that consumers are starting to kind of get a little bit more hot on this in terms of the cost. So let's stay with the challenges then. So, you know, this year we've, again, like, you know, the last couple of years, we, we're all facing huge challenges, big global conflicts, rising living costs, and lots of talk about food insecurity in the news. So given those challenges, are you both seeing that, that is now actually starting to drive trends. And I'm interested in either whether that's positive or negative, actually. So Ben, over to you. Yeah, I think we're very careful to talk about trends as not being things that come and go. So the difference right. between kind of like a fad and a trend. So something that sort of blows up, goes viral, or maybe a social platform overnight, and two weeks later, no one's talking about it anymore. Like, is, is that really a trend? Whereas what we're definitely seeing with trends is that food is becoming more and more important in people's lives. Mm but only as a result of having to cut back on other things. Right. So we're seeing, you know, we're recording here a mile from the West End and things like the theatre world is really struggling because theatre tickets are going up, people are going out to the theatre less, but they're spending more time eating in at home. So making, bringing back the dinner party in that sense. So it's kind of people are spending a little bit more on food because it is more accessible, it is more available than perhaps some of the other treats. So where people are cutting back on other things, food can bring a sense of joy and togetherness and you can get friends and family around a table. However, there are still constant challenges about how easy that is because people don't necessarily have the skill sets. So we look at a lot of fads and like big things that blow up on social media because they're really quite fun to look at. But actually the overriding trends are I think more positive. Okay, that's encouraging. More positive trends. Matthew, what's your sense? Yeah, I think that's such a helpful distinction, Ben, to talk about what is a fad and what is a trend. And the conversation, right, the discourse on social media, how people are talking about food, I'm finding those debates to be really loud <laughs> and really polarizing. So I think it's interesting to kind of tease apart, right? What are the conversations that are happening? And then what's actually happening in the background? And I think you are getting these really loud voices, again, to think about this vegans versus regenerative agriculture people. I think both of them have great points, right? <laughs> to adopt more plant-based, plant-forward diets, to be able to make more sustainable livestock systems. Those are both wonderful directions, but they're arguing so much at each other. And meanwhile, we've got the same kind of system being pervasive in the background. Mm. All right, okay, so uh, people are kind of arguing the points with each other, but actually underneath it all, maybe that's not actually making any real change. Okay, all right, that, that's useful context, folks. So, Ben, I'm keen to come to you to start talking about, you know, consumers. So consumer needs and trends, let's say, so we're not necessarily fads. You're really tapped into the, those sort of needs and trends for consumers based on, you know, your Sorted Food YouTube channel. So what what are you really seeing from the content that you're, that you're driving out? What do consumers want right now? What's super hot and do you think will continue to be hot for consumers? Yeah, I mean, in that sense, we're very lucky. Like we sit at the heart of this global community all over the world who are incredibly vocal and engaged in the content. So we just sit there, really just listen. And, and almost as puppets, we're creating content that we know this audience want. And we have our strings pulled and they will tell us what they want to watch. They will watch in larger numbers the stuff we put out that delivers on that. So we are therefore doubling down on the things that matter right. to that audience. And honestly, it's, it's convenience. And I would say it's something we've kind of coined flavor bombs, which is really interesting ingredients from other cuisines usually that you can keep in your store cupboard or fridge they've got a long shelf life and you know what just a dollop in here or a dollop in there will really elevate your cooking even right. the most basic of things and the cheaper things like vegetables and the alike so examples gochujang so a fermented chili paste from south korea miso white miso goes an awful long way with a little bit of dairy fat in a whole host of different dishes not just japanese food right. and we're seeing those kind of ingredients people are buying stashing away in like a store cupboard, staple cupboard, ready to use and elevate their food because it's hugely convenient. 
and you can get 80% of the way there to like restaurant quality with 20% of the effort because it's just a dollop of this. Right. And I think it's that convenience paired with flavor bombs. We're seeing people begin to shift the way they cook. And part of that comes down to just a global curiosity around cuisines. Right. Okay. And is this something that going to your kind of backstory, I mean, understanding, you know, what makes people tick when it comes to food is that kind of where this all started for you? Uh, you know, is that is that yeah. why you started the show? I mean, absolutely, it's hacking the system. Right. So 13, 14 years ago, it started because we were a group of mates and we were at university and food was a real challenge for us individually. Mm. Um, I was training to be a chef and I lived with six other chefs. So for us, it was just second nature. We didn't think about it. We'd go down to the local market in Birmingham. We'd pick up a shoulder of lamb because it's really cheap cut. And we put it on at six o'clock on a Wednesday evening, really low and slow in the oven with a few spices. And then Wednesday night was the big social night at university. We'd go out, we'd have some drinks at the student union bar. We'd go out, out. And then eventually we'd come back and at 11, 12 o'clock, this has been slow roasting for six hours and we'd have amazing Ooh. lamb kebabs for a fraction of the price <laughs> and much better than you can get on the high street when you're drunk on the way home. Now, that's not normal. And that's where we've <laughs> I always... Gonna, we've, I was going to say, you were a lot more prepared than I was. And that's, that's, that's our approach always, is that chefs think in different ways. They are yeah. forced to think because they work in hospitality, food is money and you're always looking at the bottom line. Chefs always think in unusual, weird ways. How can we unlock that for normal people because that behavior is not normal for students but it's really easy why shouldn't it be normal so we just try and unlock that and, and find a way of putting in loads of hacks and tips and tricks that mean that normal home cooks can begin to pick up some of this knowledge that comes out of chef's brains and apply it to themselves because it will save money save time save effort deliver on delicious food and because you're scratch cooking ultimately it's generally a bit better for you as well Talk to him about scratch cooking. What what do you mean by that? And is is that got anything to do with the? I, I, you know, I've had a checked out your your app, Sorted Sidekick, as well, which is like your weekly meal planner. It, does that all kind of start forming together? It does, and I think I feel like you've teed me up nicely here because scratch cooking, I think, has also changed a lot recently. I think the original definition of scratch cooking is just a bunch of raw ingredients, and you need to know the basics of ultimately as we were taught as chefs, like French cuisine and all the core skills that enable you to cook a whole host of dishes. Right. And it can be quite time consuming. You need a certain element of skill. And that's scratch cooking. However, I would say as a trend in the last few years, we've seen people redefine scratch cooking as anything that involves combining two or more ingredients. So buying pasta and a pasta sauce to ultimately processed or ultra processed ingredients and put them together is scratch cooking. Right. So people are now tapping into a lot more convenient products. Microwave pouch of pre-cooked rice will get you a lot quicker to a stir fry with loads of veggies. And it can be a really sort of healthy option midweek and it's super quick. But the scratch cooking element is often using a lot more processed foods and it's more of an assembly now than maybe the scratch cooking of the generation before. Okay, that's really interesting. So it's that we were saying about before, it's that convenience mixed with people wanting to have that kind of like, you know, exotic, fun experience, but in a time constrained environment. Okay, that's interesting. So from what you're seeing again in your channel, so some broader areas I'd like to discuss, we've spoken a lot about personalized nutrition on the show i mean go back three years I and mean, we were talking about it was fairly elitist it was quite niche then it started to become something which was a bit more actually you can personalize nutrition based on like groups of people so like you know older people where you can put sort of functional food methods into yogurts and things like that so you can serve wider needs better but now you've got things like uh, like zoe app in the uk where you can really get quite specific is that something that you're seeing as a trend on your channel? Are people interested in this? They are. And I think, I guess our audience are already invested in food. So they're already right. kind of probably skew a little bit more towards the foodie audience than the absolute normal home cook. So we are seeing an interest in it. But I think it's still the interest at a really simple demystify it for me kind of way because mm. I don't really understand the science. So just break it down into like, what do I have to do? And that's partly where all the sort of fermented food. So your kimchi, gut-friendly bacteria yep. and yogurts, live yogurts, um, sauerkraut. These are all like on the up. We've seen a lot more of them in recent years. Kombucha, they're really good for the gut. Nobody really understands what's going on in our gut unless you are really into that and you've spent your life dedicated to understanding it. But we can all kind of go, if we do a bit more of that, it's probably good. So I think people are still taking broad strokes because the knowledge base isn't there. 
but we all kind of want to do the right thing. So if you can give it to me in a really easy way and tell me that this kimchi, if I serve it with this, is going to be thumbs up, right. then that's that's enough for most people, I think. And all the better if it tastes great. And it always tastes great. Yeah. Okay, got it. And, and Matthew, I can see that you're nodding along there while Ben's talking. Any, any sort of perspectives from yourself, anything on personalised nutrition or, or anything that you know, Ben's just spoken about that you want to comment on? Yeah, so first of all, I feel like someone in the comment section of Assorted Food video right now sharing my thoughts. This is really, you know, Ben's, Ben's territory here. One thing I find interesting is the ultra-processed foods. There's a big right, debate happening around that. And I think it's not a black and white issue, right? Yeah, there is a major convenience factor where we're, we're stressed on time, we're stressed on our wallet. Like, there is a very good reason. And it's delicious, right? It's also been engineered to be quite addictive. So that's another element of it. Mm. So I think... One thing though, the the ultra processed foods is almost getting a bit of a backlash. It's getting this kind of, let's adopt a more natural diet. And what is a natural diet? I mean, that's something that's very debated and I don't think there's a clear definition of that. But I think people in the meat industry are using that as like, let's eat animals that are hunted, you know, wild game. Let's eat animals that are raised outdoors year round. That's meat is a natural, healthy part of the human diet. And I think you are getting a bit more marketing on that aspect of it. Okay. And do you see that also blending into sort of the health aspects as well? I mean, this is something that, uh, you know, the average person we always struggle with is trying to make sure we have sort of healthy, delicious food, which is also sustainable. And you've both spoken about sort of food waste and loss, which is obviously a really important trend, but that kind of move towards you know, more sustainable eating. Are you both seeing a move towards that, both from the industry side and from a consumer side? Is is that starting to pick up? Is that going to be a big trend in 2024, do you think? Uh, you know, Matthew, what do you think? I think healthy, sustainable food will always be, you know, at the top. That, that's, a, that's the goal, right? <laughs> but where there's a lot of other factors, there's economic, social, cultural factors. Mm. And I think it's really difficult to deal with the convenience factor. So is there a way, as I think Ben, you were saying earlier, can we make healthy, sustainable food accessible? Can we bake the, I, I really love that. I take like 80% of, uh, get 80% of the way there with 20% of the ingredients, right? Like how do we put more joy into cooking? I mean, I also worked in restaurants and working in a restaurant is also a bit different sometimes because it could, it could take the joy out of cooking. But when I come home, that's when I really get to kind of experiment only when I have the energy for it. <laughs> So what do you think then, Ben? I mean, is it, what Matthew's saying is it's, yes, there's an uptick, but it, it's more from a, a side angle, you know, that people are more interested in it. In Food's got to be convenient. It's got to be tasty. If it's, uh, you know, healthy, great. But if it's also sustainable, yeah, happy. Yeah, and I think you, you see, a, you know, there's still an increase in kind of the supplement market as well. And there's a lot of, the, well, maybe if I don't cook from scratch or don't eat that, I can always make do with this convenient, you know, one teaspoon or tablespoon or pill of that a day would kind of, balance it out so there's always looking for the easy option i think but that's only because moderation isn't sexy mm. it's mm. not going to get the headlines and to matthew's point like when you've got the data and the science you actually need to sit around a table and have a conversation because it's not about a headline that's going to be you must give up this or you must go 100 percent that it's always going to be a hybrid of lots of complex conversations which is all about moderation and moderation doesn't sell mm. and yet that's what i think we all need to do we need to cut back on meat consumption whether we need to go completely vegan personally i don't think so but there's lots of moderation and middle ground but you need to eat more beans well beans aren't particularly sexy either and and lentils and these aren't necessarily the foods that we crave mm. because we've spent decades having so much choice that actually we have cherry picked the best dishes and recipes from cuisines all over the world we don't eat an entire cuisine we look, Italian food is one of the most travelled cuisines, but we're talking lasagna, pizza, carbonara. We're not necessarily talking minestrone, mm. grilled fish and vegetables, and all the other balance that comes with the cuisine. We just cherry pick the really best bits from each cuisine, and we don't eat an entire cuisine. So, this is probably another podcast, but how do you how do you unpick that then? I mean, from what you're seeing, I mean. Yes, we cherry pick. Often we cherry pick, let's be honest, not the best parts of, mm. from all other cuisines. So how do you get people to start 
you know, going into next year, going forwards, how do you get people to then be like, okay, actually, you can have your pizzas, but you need to have your minestrones. You know, you can have your pastas, but you need to look at your beans and your lentils. How, how do you start getting people just comfortable with the fact that actually they need to have moderation? They need to expand their food taste across all these different areas. Well, I mean, it's something we've been trying to sort of very, very slowly help people sort of shift their behaviours at home as a normal home cook. And that's what Psychic does. It's trying to do be your sidekick in the kitchen so you can be the hero and do all the fun bits. Right. And that is about kind of sort of nudge behaviour towards taking the hassle out of the boring bits, which is the planning and the shopping. Mm -hmm. So you can enjoy the cooking and very much enjoy the eating. And even the cooking, we, we distill down so you we almost choreograph you around your kitchen so that at the end of it you finish with all your washing up done. So you've just put this on today. You've now got five minutes to wait for that. Why not wash up everything you've already done? Because as chefs, going back to us as weirdos, we always clean as we go. We think like sort of Gantt charts, like where can we overlap tasks to make sure that it's the most efficient as possible? Mm -hmm. Because in the industry, you have to. At home, washing up goes over there, piles up, piles up. You've cooked, you've eaten, it's lovely. And now you've got this really messy kitchen. So our job and Psychic's job is how do you do all the, the admin how do you help to plan menus that share fresh ingredients, but also allow you to have a couple of really indulgent dishes and one that uses up the leftovers in a more healthy, lighter option on day three? And then how do you plan a shopping list so it's smart and intelligent and is based on average packet sizes in the supermarket? So you need to buy 150 grams of sour cream. You can because that's the portion it's sold in, not asking you to buy 100 grams and waste the other 50. So we do all the kind of the admin as your sidekick so that you can just be the hero and enjoy the fun bits, which is should be the cooking and it should be something you can enjoy at the end of the day because you can get real pride out of getting great results and then more importantly a delicious plate of food because you just need to get that on the table conveniently quickly and without breaking the bank i love it and i am so gonna be looking at that for uh, my new year's resolution so uh, yeah and i encourage everybody else out there to check ben's sidekick out that sounds awesome so another thing that ben's channel does so well is it highlights cuisine from across the world right where you think about uh, across South Asia, Southeast Asia, you've got a lot of vegetable forward, you know, the Mediterranean diet, really veg forward fish. Mm. You've got a lot of wonderful ingredients and you put them at the center of the plate and you get excited about them. It's not the cuisine I grew up with. I grew up in New York eating a lot of Italian food, right? It's, it's sauce, bread and cheese and five different variations. And you've got 15 different dishes and they're all delicious, but you don't have the same kind of variety around it. So yeah, I think my own personal journey was learning about other cuisines and cultures and learning how to cook them. And that was an exciting part that it led me to my own kind of more quote, sustainable, healthy diet. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And I'm, I have been on my own journey as well as a child of the 80s, where let's be honest, ultra processed food was the thing. I have definitely gone from that to uh, to where I am now, which is very, very different. Matthew, I'm keen to come to you uh, to talk to you about, because of all the research that you do, you've got a really good sort of broad view of what's going on in the industry. So as mentioned, you've got this understanding of attitudes because of the table platform. Can you tell us about the table, what exactly it is and you know what you do and why. Basically what you alluded to before was that science alone doesn't get us to the answer, right? Science, if we all just quote, followed the science, we'd be in a very different place with climate change right now. So our organization, we look at people's values, we look at their assumptions about the world, how it works, how it ought to work. We talk about also their ethics. So if you're someone who, I'm using the, the meat analogy a lot, but if you're someone who thinks animals shouldn't be eaten when alternatives exist, or if you believe everyone in the world should have access to nutritious meat, you're gonna reach a very different conclusion about what the future of food should look like. Mm. So we really take that as our starting point, right? That people are approaching these conversations from very different places. And then we talk to a lot of different people from the industry, from policy. Uh, we talk to farmers and food producers. We talk to CEOs and researchers. And all of them are sort of defining problems in a similar way, but building their solutions on the back of them differently. So I think that's what I'm kind of keen to uh, continue to explore is seeing how we can have this, you know, quote, food system transformation. And how do we get there and we not leave anyone behind in that process? So what is a just transition for the food system look like? And then you've got really radical visions from let's have a fossil free food system. If we're aiming for a fossil free food system, that's a real, you know, far reaching goal. But again, mm. how do we get there? 
you know, are we going to replace these technologies? Are we going to have the same kind of system that we have today? Or are we going to do these more, quote, regenerative or agroecological solutions where you've got a lot more diversified farms, which sounds really good in practice. But again, how do we transition there, right? How do we find the, the support for those types of systems to exist? So one thing we're really trying to navigate is what are the solutions out there? What's the whole table and menu of solutions? What are their motivations and values? And then trying to put them in conversation with each other, because just like our social media ecosystem, we in the food, we live in a really polarized discourse. So we're really only talking to each other. So our goal is really to kind of put people who sit on opposite sides of these conversations, put them in the same room and let's see if we could all kind of agree on some side, at least the framing of the issues and ideally on solutions. Yeah, I, I love it. And I find this is what I love about, uh, you know, the Food Fight podcast as well, is you, you can pull people in from different perspectives. And then that kind of discussion when you've got people from different angles is fascinating. So based on that, then, Matthew, so big opinions, getting people together to have these discussions. So any kind of topics that have surfaced for you, which, you know, have become quite, you know, really big things looking to be bigger next year? Or have you learned anything new from these debates that you think it would be super relevant for our listeners? I think I can lead with something that you've been tracking yourself on the podcast, which is regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so tricky. I'm not the one to say, you know, outwardly endorse every aspect of it. I think it's a great message, which your guest, Ethan Soloviev, the chief innovation officer of How Good, brilliantly articulated an episode that came out uh, in December. Paraphrase, he said something like, why settle for sustainability? Don't you want to leave the environment in a better place than where you left it? And that's mm -hmm. what regenerative agriculture sets out to do. I also completely support the practices that fall under the regenerative movement. You've got cover cropping, crop rotation, holistically managed grazing of different ruminants. You've got agroforestry. All these things are on-farm practices that will improve biodiversity and soil health. So again, I've got nothing to complain about all that. But I do have some concerns about these concepts being greenwashed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot of big claims around how much carbon we can sequester in soils to reverse the impacts of climate change, which isn't terribly verified by scientific studies. You can see positive impacts on biodiversity, on improved soil health. But again, that's a pretty vague idea. So how do we know we're not just putting a better filter on the profile of a system that frankly has a lot of problems? So. One thing I'm really looking at and I'll be tracking is what images are they kind of putting forward as the image of regenerative agriculture? You know, they're putting this family farm, but does that really reflect the reality anymore? Do we really have this kind of, you know, one barn, family farm, couple goats, couple cows, couple chickens, some sheep? You don't really see that as much because we've scaled up our farm systems tremendously. So I think there's a lot of good things about kind of the economies of scale and the efficiencies that we run in our food system, but are we tweaking it enough to get to the goal and get to the target that we need to reach? So I support these practices in carbon forming, but I just want people to kind of not just say these really nice words, but match it with their actions. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about regenerative farming on the show. We talked to a lot of regenerative farmers and, you know, for us, actually the really interesting part is when you kind of mix the, what's that expression, back to soil way of farming with, with like high technology. That mm. is actually when I think regenerative becomes really interesting because it then becomes actually really scalable. But of course, doing that in practice is quite difficult. So how do we scale these solutions, right? We need to agree on some systems of measurement. So how do we agree on soil organic carbon being measured across farms? That's a really tricky thing to do, but we're getting a lot more tools and we're having a lot more of these conversations. So if we can create these kind of universal standards. I think maybe we'll see some benefits on the back of that. Minimally, it will incentivize people to promote more of these on-farm sustainable practices. On the rough end though, if it leads to the practice of just big companies buying carbon offsets, which are, mm. that's one way you could just get a great way to have companies continue their environmentally damaging practices. So again, are we window dressing here or are we really putting our money where our mouth is and having a nice set of uh, reforms in the future? Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, sage words, Matthew, and I think we all have to be very conscious of that. Um, on the point, actually, around sort of universal definitions, I think that would be a massive step forward in, in regenerative, because I think what's happening with regenerative is 
it, well, speaking to farmers, there's a lot of farmers out there who are actually almost balking at the at the term because they're like, well, we've kind of always been doing this, mm-hmm. um, and it's now being having this kind of rubber stamp of regenerative farming. But actually, regenerative farming is is very inclusive. It's just it needs that kind of inclusive standard which needs to be put in place. It also talks a lot, um, Ben, around food provenance. So, you know, people being actually now quite interested in in where their food comes from, how the animals have been reared, you know, the kind of soil that crops are being grown in. How do you track that across the food system? From your perspective, are, are you seeing that consumers on your channel are actually more and more interested in where their food comes from and the value of the food that they're eating? Yes, 100 percent, but only in formats that already lend themselves to the information they want to consume. So I think going back to a normal home cook, and I think, you know, the the three of us sat around here now chatting, we have a very sort of skewed look because we understand a little bit more, and I know a fraction of what the pair of you do, but understand a little bit more of that world. However, when we start talking about carbon sequestering and soil health and biodiversity, these are words that Joe Public are not aware of and even if we had a global definition every country every nation every different farmland and farm use is is going to be different so our job is to find a way of putting some of those nuggets of information into content that is entertaining and inspiring first Mm. rather than going out to teach and preach because i think then people will switch off to it so our job always is just to host a conversation we also don't have the right answers and we don't really feel like as sorted it's our job to say that it is this way or that way Our job is just to conduct a conversation for a community, bring in experts where necessary because we don't have the expertise and just have the conversation. And when we've done that kind of content, it's been fascinating both for us as co-founders, 13 years on this journey, we're still learning so much. Mm. But also we then see the comments, you know, we publish a video and in a lot of the publishing world, the moment you publish, that's it. That's the end of that piece of work and project and you're on to the next one for us that's really just the start of the conversation because then the comments dive in and they have very very open conversations and most of it very positive but actually even the negative stuff is constructively negative Mm. or or putting forward an opinion that isn't just throwing their toys out the pram and 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 not being prepared to listen and we've met some farmers all over uh, europe who are looking at you know particular ingredients and new ways and i think it is the blend of technology with this understanding of regen Hmm. that becomes interesting. But to bring it back to something they want to watch, we then have to put that in some kind of cooking competition format. So two of us are going to go head to head to create a rice dish that best celebrates rice farming in Northern Italy. Oh, I'd love to do that. So then I did a risotto with frog meat, sautéed frog meat, because that I learned. I had no idea. I had not associated Northern Italian paddy fields. We were told we were going to see paddy fields, and I presumed sort of head off to Asia, Mm. completely forgetting there's paddy fields that use the the runoff water from the Alps in northern Italy and obviously risotto. And we learnt loads about how the frogs in the paddy fields help in this kind of symbiotic relationship. And and, and that was just fascinating. So then we do a dish that kind of celebrates that story. And meanwhile, Barry was cooking a dish that used rice in a completely different way. So the whole episode was really about two rice dishes competing against each other to win the best dish. Right. But underpinning that was loads of learning from farmers and understanding a bit more about the challenges they are faced with drought and and climate change, but also how technology and science is enabling them to kind of find positive solutions. Otherwise, it all becomes a bit doom and gloom. So you've got to offer the, the hopeful, positive story and solution to that, as well as delicious food. Yeah. Okay. I get it. So you 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 sort of place the the fun, enjoyable content out there, get people super engaged, and if they kind of learn, you know, the things that go into their food off the back, then so much the better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Get it. I completely agree with you. Right. Biodiversity, soil health, carbon sequestration. These are terms that are going to go completely over people's heads and my own head. You know, fifteen years ago. Right. That was not a world that I was in at all. So I can completely empathize with that. One, our audience is largely the food system nerds. So they're really, you know, tapped into it. They're deep into these kind of conversations and they're really looking at like, what is the nuance here? But we also want to expand our audience. And the way that we're working to do that is putting these human-centered stories, right? Not Mm -hmm. talk about this concept or this definition, but like, what was this farmer's experience over the last three generations, right? What was this farm's experience over the last three generations as it was passed down from farmer to farmer? And how can you tell that story as a way to talk about 
policy changes, about economic incentives, about how the world has changed, how food cultures have changed. So yeah, it's kind of working in the specific and then getting to these more universal, relatable ideas. Love it. Actually, I'm learning a lot here. So actually, maybe a trend going into next year is just simplifying content and making it super fun and enjoyable. And that is therefore the best way to serve up kind of food education to people as well. I'm going to definitely take that. Guys, um, let's talk about the future. And when I say the future, I'm talking beyond 2024. We always like to talk about um, any crazy trends or punts that you have for the future in the sense that have you picked up on anything that you've seen which you're like, ah, that could be really big in the future? I mean, we spoke, and this is nothing to do with food systems, everyone, but we spoke uh, offline about um, grilling ice, which is becoming quite big in China, where people are literally spicing ice and grilling it and then serving it. And who knew that that could be a thing? So any kind of crazy trends or super interesting out there trends that you've both seen or, or interested in yourselves? Ben, I'd like to start with you. So one of the things we do quite a lot on the channel is look at things that have emerged and often on other platforms. So I'd say kind of YouTube really is our home. It's kind of our hero platform. It's where we put the long conversations that can happen across 20 minutes and there's all sorts of learning to happen. But you look at short form content content in sort of portrait and places like TikTok is amazing for inspiration. But what it, we're finding it's doing is it's giving pre-existing ideas and traditions a new platform to new audience. So you're seeing things like, what was the example, um, from Southeast France, ravioli from oh, Dauphiné ravioli. Mm -hmm. which is basically you make a, a big piece of ravioli and rather than cut it into individual, it's just served as one big thing. Right. And it's filled with French herbs and creme fraiche. It's a completely traditional dish that has existed forever and ever, but suddenly found new fame on TikTok. Yeah. So I think whilst we will probably look past the likes of watermelon pizza and uh, ice cream fried chicken sandwiches, because I think that's just sensationalism of kind of like familiar things put together that people just want to drool over but will never actually do mm. i think what we'll start to see is platforms like tiktok and short form content so shorts on youtube and instagram reels highlighting what has always been but perhaps forgotten about right. and i think that's the trends will go back to foraging moderation fermenting scratch cooking and diy and and actually iconic dishes from cuisines that have kind of been forgotten will find a new place. So interestingly for me, I think new trends that we will see will just be new but not original. Yeah, I love it. it. Almost an arc back to before we messed up the food systems, yeah. this was a thing. And I think that's becoming quite cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. So forgotten foods are almost finding a new place and a new life. And it's that, it's that classic thing about innovation, isn't it? Innovation is effectively you take something which exists and you, you kind of do something new with it. And I guess the new channels... To, a new, to a new and, generation. And, and they are discovering it on platforms that are familiar to them in habits, consumption habits of, you know, scroll, scroll, scroll. That's interesting. Mm. I'll dig in and look a bit further. But it's almost, again, you can't preach it. You can't force it down their throats. They've almost got to find it and find a love for it themselves. And then... That works. So entertainment first, and hats off to you know things like Clarkson's Farm in the last few years that has suddenly put phrases like mob grazing into the mainstream, and but it's done it in an entertaining way, personality led, with this underpinning. Ah, there's something in this, and I hadn't really considered that element of farming before, and I think that's still going to be the way forward. Personality led, entertaining, inspiring things that probably arc back to what already existed before we messed up the systems. Love that. Okay, so personality-led sort of forgotten foods. Matthew, what about yourself? Any kind of crazy trends or big plays you think for the you know the future beyond 2024? Yeah, I'll follow that same exact line of thinking, but apply it towards food production. So taking these, you know, organic agroecological approaches to growing food, growing it in these more sustainable ways that were more common in past generations, and applying this biotech to it thinking about how can we at the same time create these diversified farming systems and also give these really precise amounts of fertilizer or pesticides to them so we're not wasting you know we talk about food waste we also waste a ton of farm inputs that's just the, mm. the scale of our fossil fuel dependence on farm inputs is absolutely enormous there was a, a report that came out earlier this year that said 15 percent of fossil fuel use is on the farm system which is just a mighty, mighty number that 
gives a lot of opportunity to sort of it then creates this target, right? It says, look, this is where we're at and this is where we need to be. Maybe the number is not zero, but it's certainly a reduction. So how do we get there? So I think not just the on-farm practices, but also these, these measurement tools that we have, right? We're getting better forms of analysis. A lot of this is related to AI and machine learning. We're able to take these really big data sets and read them and put them in conversation with each other across the world. So how do we tap into those so we're kind of steering everything in the right direction? And I think as our measurement tools have improved, you know, we're able to reach those targets more effectively. I knew we'd get AI into this conversation at some point. So thank you, Matthew, for doing that. Yeah, AI is going to take over, but in a really good way for the food system. And can I ask you both as well, yeah, we can talk about crazy trends, but are there any kind of problems and challenges that you're seeing from your perspectives that you would really like to see being solved going forwards? So we've spoken about regenerative agriculture, we've spoken about food waste. Is there anything else that you're sort of seeing at the moment which you're like, actually, I'd really like somebody to really unpick that and, and provide a solution to it? What do you think, Ben? Two T's, trust and transparency, I think. And I think our job as a publishing channel and as a community and, and putting together content on behalf of a global audience are watching it's our job to do our due diligence and make sure that what we are presenting is as fair and accurate as we possibly can get it yeah but that is becoming increasingly difficult because of no universal measure as we spoke about earlier but also the sort of overuse of marketing buzzwords you know healthy how do you define healthy mm. healthy to one person is completely different to somebody else and it's often a lack of understanding of nutrition and, and 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 diets you know you hear phrases like i'm avoiding foods with gluten because i just eat high protein like, well, gluten is protein so that whole conversation is just mixed up because of a misunderstanding of nutrition it's not to say it's wrong but even the vocab and the words are just often in the wrong place so we see a lot of greenwashing is maybe too much to sort of say but healthy and sustainable like what actually are these and how do you find a trusted and transparent way of presenting that so that people can rely on it and not have to second guess it. Yeah, that's a big challenge to unpick. And I think, you know, the three people talking here are all very, very focused on making sure the information that we send out is credible and trusted and making sure that you pull in the right people to have these discussions. Matthew, what about you? Any kind of challenges or a big challenge that you would like to see solved and unpicked? Yeah, I'd like us to shout at each other just a little bit less. <laughs> just, just, what, to, you mean just us, us, us three particularly, no, or just no, no, in we're general? doing fine. I think, oh, I right, think we're okay. on the. Um, but, but I think that comes with what our values are, right? We're, we're searching for the answers. We don't have them, right? We're, we're looking mm. to host conversations with people who see the world differently, and that's a valiant effort, right? That's one way to platform a number of different views on the same space. So if, if we're able to do that, if we're able to find, you know, less of these uh, echo chambers, then perhaps we are going to be able to not assume the worst of the other side, right? I think that's something that uh, happens quite a lot is that people just, they assume bad faith arguments instead of these shared values, which are largely shared, right? Again, what do these words mean? But we are aiming for sustainable, healthy, easily accessible, culturally appropriate types of food. All those things are things that we're aiming for. How to get there is a little bit difficult, but if we say that we're all aiming for those values, then maybe we're not, we don't need to argue. Maybe we don't need to scream at each other in the process and say, look, my solution in my region is going to look a little bit different than yours. But all that takes is, yeah, diversity and moderation, which again is how do we make moderation sexy? How do we make beans and lentils sexy? I think this is, you know, a, a big effort moving forward. Mm -hmm. Moderation and inclusivity. Yeah, definitely sage, wise words there. Thank you, Matthew. And from sage to something a bit more fun, shall we say. So we like to ask this question on the show because it kind of yields some interesting answers. So if you had unlimited budget and time, what technology would you like to create to help fix the food system? So it's like magic wand time. If you could have anything and you could, you know, magic box of something, what would that be to help fix the foods, food system? Ben, tough question. Any thoughts? I think there is actually a technology I think that already exists in hospitality and industry that I would love if I could major, uh, wave a magic wand put into every household. Mm -hmm. And that is something that goes on your bin that measures 
the value of the food you throw away because we live in a society where we are constantly told all the headlines in papers and media tell us that food inflation is sky high and that it's massive problems. Then you get to the supermarket and you go round and you get to the checkout and you're told how much this is going to cost and there's prices this and prices that. Everyone's trying to price match, but it's all still more expensive than it was. And then you pay for it. At the end of the month, your bank statement consolidates everything you've spent on food and tells you how much you're spending on food. Nobody calculates how much money you're throwing away mm. each week. And it is only a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a quarter of a pepper that's gone a bit floppy and half a tub of sour cream that's grown a fur coat. But if you add up the value of all of that, it's a third of the food we're buying. And if we could just stop doing that, everyone would be more wealthy, which is a short-term fix and everyone would love that. Mm. But we would also do so much to help change the emissions that go into creating that food waste, not just when it goes to landfill, but the creation of it and if there was just something magical that could sit on your bin and tell you this week you've thrown away four pounds seventy five, mm. people would stop doing it. That's right. You're absolutely right. And it would also reconnect people to the value of food, not just economically, but actually kind of where it starts to come from. And surely as well, you know, if often what happens when you know big things come out, it goes commercial, it then the technology evolves and then it becomes something that you can have in the home. So I very much hope that that is coming. When I used to work in kitchens and I remember that there was a, a big hotel kitchen and the chef, we had see-through bin liners and the head chef would literally walk around the kitchen and you would be literally scolded or given extra shifts or you'd end up having to wash the spinach and, and pick the peas, all the terrible jobs. If there was something in that bin that could have been turned into something to put on the menu and sell right. because food equals money. And there was you couldn't hide, you couldn't go, oh, I can't be bothered to carefully trim this, I'm just going to hack it off. And yeah. if that goes in and if the head chef saw essentially money in the bin, then there were problems. But we don't have that at home. Okay. So we all need something to go on our bin and also a head chef to tell us off yeah, right now when we do yeah. it. Yeah. And Matthew, what about yourself? Uh, magic one time. So just a quick comment on Ben's and then I'll uh, share mine. So there, I went to a farm workshop once that had a similar exercise. They were cutting a head of cauliflower from the field and they did a bad cut and someone just threw up. There's five bucks. <laughs> they mishandled or dropped the crate that was holding a bunch of vegetables and some of them got bruised. Oh, there's 20 bucks. You know, how do you bring the kind of economic impacts of these decisions and make it tangible? And this was a way to make kind of small farms more profitable. And I think, yeah, making that as concrete as possible for people right in front of their face, I think would be a fantastic addition. One thing that is actually out there presently that I think deserves more attention and perhaps could be scaled to other regions, there's a new app that's been developed called Dupasso do Prato. And this is in Brazil. And this is one way to track the deforestation footprint, the sanitation conditions, and whether slave labor was involved in the beef that was produced in Brazil and they put a little, you scan a little QR code in a grocery store, or you scan the barcode in a grocery store, and then you could find out what the potential environmental or social footprints were of the product. That has had amazing impacts on industry. It's made them more transparent about the data that they've given. It's also one way to kind of encourage them to do better practices. It's also given, you know, more information and empowered consumers to make better mm -hmm. decisions. So I really like this. I think there's versions of it. I like that they also kept it very simple. Right. You could only look at one of these metrics or you look at three, but it's not 20 indicators. Right. It's just one with maybe you're most interested only in slave labor or deforestation footprint. Those might get scanned more and then they'll give you that information so you can make an informed choice about the product. Um, one thing that surprisingly we haven't talked about is alternative meats. <laughs> It hasn't come up. Funnily, funnily <laughs> enough, um, I actually I wanted to talk about it, and then we've kind of moved around it. But uh, you know, feel feel free. Let's have that discussion. So interesting year for alternative meats, right? Mm. Uh, lots of headlines. I don't think there was again not a lot of things actually changed, but there was tons of headlines. Oh, it's failing. It's doing great. A lot of news, but again, it was kind of it's it's a slow and steady. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So. One product or one company particularly that I'm really interested in is uh, Sci-Fi Foods in California, and mm -hmm. they do they do hybrid, so they do 10% from animal cells and the rest is from plants. That's the number that they're working at presently, right? That ratio might change in the future, but it's one way to kind of integrate as much as the the taste and the texture and the muscle of meat while also doing what's scalable, right? Because presently, a lot of these technologies, when you try to incorporate a larger animal, a larger amount of animal cells into the product, you're not finding, we haven't yet had that technological breakthrough. 
So I, I, I like this hybrid approach. I'm really interested in it. I also like their marketing. They're a little cheeky. They call themselves sci-fi foods, right? They're thinking about, all right, how do we make this a little fun, a little futuristic? They're not saying, look, this is going to solve everything. They're just saying like, look, join the future. You know, come along with us on this ride. Yeah, I love that. And actually, it really talks to what you were saying, Ben, about making sure that this is fun. You know, you embrace the fun, you embrace that kind of engagement. And to that point around, you know, people talk about, you know, Frankenfoods and all that. But actually, they've kind of leaned into that in the sense that this this is the future. You know, you just need to get on board. And, you know, we've had people on the show before talking about the power of hybrid foods. And actually, if you can blend things, then I think there's potentially a lot more acceptance there as well. So thank you, Matthew, for bringing that up. I'm very, very glad that we got to that because we did sort of skirt around it at some point. Both, thank you. That's been fascinating. I've had such a good time. I love the Trends show and I'm sure our listeners will as well. So before we kind of close, can I ask um, you both, where can listeners go for more information about you and what you do? Uh, for us, it's nice and simple. It's Sorted Food, so S-R-T-E-D Food, and you'll find us everywhere. YouTube or sortedfood.com uh, will link you out to where you need to find us. Fantastic. Thank you. And Matthew? Tabledebates.org is your one-stop shop to access all of Table Materials, including the podcast called Feed a Food Systems Podcast. Amazing. Thank you both. So big thanks there both to Ben and Matthew for uh, giving us all of their insights, both from across uh, the consumer world, but also the industry world as well. So some really kind of headline takeaways that I've been scribbling down as we've been going through the conversation. So we spoke at the top of the show about, I think all of us agreed that, you know, we want 2024 to be the year where food waste and loss, you know, really starts to become a thing of the past. Ben spoke a lot about on his YouTube channel, Sorted Food, where he's he's also starting to notice that consumers are getting much more interested in not wasting food, but that's specifically coming from an economic perspective. So actually, if you can prove to people that you know saving food saves you money, then that is a that's a double win, which we should all go after. Ben also spoke about some you know sort of continually pervasive trends around convenience and taste. You know, foods have got to be convenient, they've got to be tasty. But he also really underlined the fact that you have to make the way that we present this food to people as entertaining and engaging, otherwise they will switch off. And something that I really enjoyed a lot was when he spoke about how one of the big trends that he sees coming is where we're old foods or old traditions around foods, you know, particularly from different parts of the world, are being served up on channels like TikTok to new audiences. So it's not actually something new, but it's just being presented in a way which is engaging to new audiences, which is really, really interesting. From an industry side, Matthew spoke a lot about regenerative agriculture and so the fact that he really likes the fact that regenerative agriculture is really becoming, you know, like a, a staple of the food system. But he does worry about how far we can go with it. And, you know, obviously we're all worried about um, any kind of greenwashing to do with regenerative. Matthew also said that, you know, one of the kind of more wise things that he'd he'd like to see uh, in the world from 2024 onwards is everyone, I think he said, everyone to stop shouting at each other, where basically, you know, we all need to dial down fully entrenched opinions and actually just sit around the table and discuss these things, which I think is less of a trend, more of a just more of a behavior that everybody wants. Uh, and then finally, we did manage to squeeze in a topic around um, alternative meats. Thank you to Matthew for that and to reminding us where actually Matthew was quite f interested in the rise of blending hybrid foods. So you take a little bit of like conventional meat or cultivated meat, for example, but you blend that with mainly with plants. And that would be a nice way to transition. So thank you all again to Matthew and Ben, and thank you all for listening in. So this has been the Food Fight podcast. As ever, if you'd like to find out more, head over to the EIT Food website at eitfood.eu. Also, please join the conversation via the hashtag EIT Food Fight on our X channel at EIT Food. And if you haven't already, please hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. That's it for now, everyone. See you next time.